In the last lesson, we looked at the key terms that are used in the Canadian political system, so now let's look at the U.S. terms. Remember that term parliamentary that's used in Canada to describe anything to do with the legislative branch? Well, in the United States, it's referred to as congressional or Congress. That's the House of Representatives or the Senate. That's probably because the Americans fought a war to break away from the British and really didn't want any of their systems to refer to the British Parliament. This also relates to the term republic or republican. This term means that there's an elected head of state. In the U.S., it's the president. Because Canada's head of state is the Queen, we can't be Republican. Now, while there is a political party called the Republicans, that's not the same as the term itself. Just like how in Canada we have a Liberal Party that doesn't always act liberally. Another term used in Canada that actually doesn't exist in the United States is the unwritten Constitution. That's because it's very important to Americans to have legislation and procedures written down. So they only have the written Constitution and are a little surprised that a developed nation could work with tradition and word of mouth. While partisanship exists in both the U.S. and Canada, currently it seems to be much stronger in the U.S. This is a policy of supporting your party's policy, but it can be taken as far as rejecting any ideas of the opposing party just because it wasn't your party's idea. To be bipartisan means you're working with another party, so if there's a congressional hearing that includes members of both the Democratic and Republican parties, that's a bipartisan event. And something that's nonpartisan means it's not affiliated with either party, so say a cancer research fundraiser would be nonpartisan. Another big difference between Canada and the United States is separation of powers. Canada has responsible government, which exists because the executive branch gets their position of power from the legislative branch. In the United States, the executive branch is elected separately from the legislative branch. See how the boxes look different from Canada's? The American system was created based on the ideas of the Enlightenment philosophers, so they took Montesquieu's ideas seriously. In fact, they took it so seriously that it's against the law for the President of the United States to even sit in on debates in Congress in order to prevent him from influencing the legislative branch. A term relating to this is checks and balances. The executive and legislative branches can check or stop the other branch of government from becoming too powerful. So, for example, if Congress passes a law that the president doesn't think is in the best interest of the nation state, he can veto it, which means he can cancel that law from coming into effect. But Congress can override the president's veto if they can get a two-thirds majority to agree to it. Another example would be that the president or executive branch declares war, but the Congress or legislative branch must support it by allocating the funds to pay for it. Again, that idea of power of the purse. So the president can't go all crazy and declare war on Canada just because we made fun of him. Well, unless Congress agrees that that's the appropriate action to take. The last term that also exists in Canada but is rarely seen is the filibuster. A filibuster is when you deliberately stall the passage of a law by extending the debate. We've seen examples of in the United States where members of Congress will get up and start talking. In their system, the rule is as long as you remain standing and talking, you get the floor and can talk all night if you want. And you don't even need to be talking about politics. You can talk about your vacation, read a cookbook, that actually happened, or even talk about your grandkids. The whole point is that while you're stalling for time, there are people milling around trying to convince members to vote for your proposal. That's why it doesn't happen very often in Canada. Party solidarity states that you have to vote with your party, so stalling for time isn't going to change anything. So let's finish off with some terms that are used in both Canada and the U.S. on a regular basis. First one, federalism. It's a term that often confuses people because we refer to our central government as the federal government. But the term federal actually means sharing of power. Some say we got the idea from the Iroquois Confederacy because the five nations were able to cooperate on big issues but still keep their autonomy. Because Canada and the U.S. are pluralistic nations with a massive geography, we knew we couldn't have a unitary government, which is one government for the whole country. Think about it. Do Albertans care about lobster fishing quotas? And should PEI have control over the Alberta tar sands? Instead, we've established a federal system where the central government will control issues that affect everyone, like defense, currency, and international relations, while the regional governments will control local issues like resources, roads, and education. These regional governments are the Canadian provincial and American state governments. Patronage is another term used in both systems. That's when you grant favors to people who have supported you. There's different opinions on patronage. Some see it as only natural that you would favor your supporters. But individualists say that everyone should be treated equally in a society regardless of who supported your election campaign. That's why in Canada, the individualist province of Alberta has always shown the least support for patronage when compared to provinces in eastern Canada, especially Atlantic Canada, who used to have pretty blatant patronage in the 1960s. 
and the civil service. It's the group of people who work for the government but aren't elected. Usually when we talk about civil servants, we're talking about all of the people who work in government departments to help cabinet ministers do their job, like the accountants who work for Revenue Canada. Public school teachers, police officers, they're all civil servants because we work for the government. 